King Solomon, urging his son to pursue wisdom, says this, The Lord gives wisdom. From his mouth come knowledge and understanding. He stores up sound wisdom for the upright. He is a shield to those who walk in integrity, guarding the paths of justice and watching over the way of his saints. We begin by singing praise to this our God, Number 187, 187, O oh God, beyond all praising, we worship you today, 187. as you sit, let's join our hearts together in prayer. Let's pray. Almighty God, loving Lord and Heavenly Father, we come before you this morning with our hearts full of praise and adoration. For you are the God who has showered unnumbered blessings and mercies without end upon us, your covenant people. You have fully revealed yourself to us, and you've called us into relationship with you so that we will know you, love you, obey you, and fear you. And we marvel when we consider the depths of your wisdom and your knowledge. 
how by wisdom you've created all things. And we pray, Heavenly Father, that you will draw near to us now this morning so that you will work in us that fear of you which is the beginning of wisdom. We confess with heavy hearts that we are so often tempted to follow the voice of folly. We all have hearts that by nature are prone to wander from you and from your paths of righteousness. So help us, gracious God. Let us be instructed by wisdom this morning, which is the fountain of life, even as it teaches us to depart from the snares of death. Please let us be a people who are zealous for the fear of you every day and all day long. We pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Well, let me welcome you all once again to the Tron Church. It's great to see you. You've battled through the snow. And uh, let me just say, if you're a visitor here or if this is your first time with us, then you're especially welcome. Uh, do make yourself known to one of us regulars. We hope you feel at home amongst us. There's no notice sheets this week, but let me tell you three things. Firstly, the congregational prayer meeting is happening this Wednesday in this building at 7.30. Please join us as we pray for our gospel partners and our church and our world. Secondly, Easter is fast approaching. And uh, at the end of the month, you, you remember that we have three uh, performances of the Mark drama happening at the three different Tron locations. Kelvin Grove uh, will host a performance on Friday the 30th of March at 7 p.m. And then Queen's Park on the following day, Saturday the 31st of March at 2 p.m. And then the final performance will take place here on uh, the same day, 31st of March and uh, at 7 p.m. Tickets are available this morning and they cost two pounds. Katie printed off some lovely tickets and you'll find them available for sale at the half landing or down at reception. Do grab some tickets. I hope you can bring some people to come and see that powerful presentation. Final notice is to announce that uh, James Irvin and Gemma Stewart got engaged this week. So big congratulations. Go team. We're delighted for you. <laughs> well done. Well, that's all the notices. We come now to our Bible reading this morning, and you'll find that in the book of Proverbs. That's on page 527, 527 of our visitors' Bibles. Willie is going to start a new short series on wisdom literature in the Bible. And this week we're going to be looking at the book of Proverbs. And we have a, a couple of readings to go through together. The first one will take place in chapter 1. So Proverbs chapter 1, beginning at verse 1. Hear the word of the Lord. The Proverbs of Solomon, son of David, king of Israel, to know wisdom and instruction, to understand words of insight, to receive instruction in wise dealing, in righteousness, justice, and equity, to give prudence to the simple, knowledge and discretion to the youth. Let the wise hear and increase in learning, and the one who understands obtain guidance. To understand a proverb and a saying, the words of the wise and their riddles. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. Now please turn on to Proverbs chapter 10. You'll find that on page 533. And we have a number of readings from chapter 10. Please look at verse 1. The Proverbs of Solomon... A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. Now please look at verse 16. The wage of the righteous leads to life, the gain of the wicked to sin. Whoever heeds instruction is on the path to life, but he who rejects reproof leads others astray. The one who conceals hatred has lying lips, and whoever utters slander is a fool. When words are many, transgression is not lacking, but whoever restrains his lips is prudent. The tongue of the righteous is choice silver, 
The heart of the wicked is of little worth. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. Now please look at verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be short. The hope of the righteous brings joy, but the expectation of the wicked will perish. The way of the Lord is a stronghold to the blameless, but destruction to evildoers. The righteous will never be removed, but the wicked will not dwell in the land. Well, amen. May God bless to us this, his word. And our offerings for the Lord's work will now be collected in. And please do take the time you should have received uh, on your chairs uh, a handout. Please do look at the back page, page two, which has an overview of the book of Proverbs. Use the time to study this and uh, our offerings for the Lord's work will now be collected. together. Heavenly Father, we know you are the source of all wisdom and you are the sovereign Lord over all things. And so we now lift our prayers to you. We pray for our government, those whom you've put in place to rule over our land. Please teach our governors, give them an abundant share of the spirit of wisdom, understanding, and knowledge that belong to Christ our sovereign Messiah. Make them quick to demonstrate that they understand the importance of fearing you. We ask that you would not silence the lips of trustworthy advisors. We think of the way in which our leaders so frequently try to take the country down the deadly paths of folly, proposing policies and legislations that seem so attractive to the eyes of the world but are actually truly damaging and destructive. Lord, may they instead lead us down paths of righteousness. And Lord, we pray for the church in this land, we, your people. We pray that we would live distinctly different lives, lives that choose to shun the way of folly and to walk the way of wisdom. We pray that this morning as we come to your word, to hear the words of the wise King Solomon, the king that you gave great wisdom. We pray that you would teach us, move our hearts and open our ears to be attentive to your voice. Please instruct us in the way of wisdom 
so that we will leave our simple and foolish ways and so that we might walk in the way of our Lord Jesus. We praise you that he is the full embodiment of wisdom. And so we pray that you would make us more into his likeness this morning. We pray all these things in Jesus' precious name. Amen. Before Willie comes to preach, we're going to sing a hymn that picks up on the theme of our reading. Number 553. 553. God, in his wisdom for our learning, gave his inspired and holy words. And as we sing this, the children will head out to their Sunday schools. 553. I do have, do have the um, outline sheet uh, with you. Uh, can you hear me? I am switched on. You can hear me now. Good. And perhaps turn with me to uh, the beginning of the book of uh, Proverbs. Lord, give us wisdom. We have such a lot of knowledge, but there's such a difference between knowledge and real wisdom. And we need wisdom. Many of you will recognize that as a frequent prayer from our sister, Jo Skelton-Smith, at our church prayer meeting. I think she prayed it just the very last time we met. And rightly so, because the Bible has so much to say about our need for wisdom. Just think of the Lord Jesus' own teaching about being wise for salvation. It's the faithful and wise servant... In Matthew chapter 24, who will be blessed and rewarded when the master returns. It's the wise virgins, not the foolish ones, who will be welcomed into the joy of the bridegroom when he returns. It's the wise man who hears and does the words of Jesus, who alone will stand in the final judgment, not the fool who is built on the sand. Wisdom is essential for salvation and for eternal life, according to Jesus. And it's essential for our maturity and for fruitful service for Christ now until that day. Just read Paul's letters and you'll see. 
In Colossians chapter 1, verse 9, for example, Paul prays that the church will be filled with the knowledge of his will in all spiritual wisdom and understanding, so as they will walk in a manner worthy of the Lord, fully pleasing to him, bearing fruit in every good work. Wisdom is essential for faithful service to God. And that's the goal of all Paul's teaching, he says, in Colossians 1, verse 28. He's teaching everyone with all wisdom to present everyone mature in Christ. Wisdom and maturity, you see, go together. And that is what leads to fruitfulness. And the context there, and in many other places, makes it very clear that such wisdom is far from being just an intellectual thing. It's not just all about theology in your head. No, no, no. Wisdom is a relational thing. It involves the heart. Paul's struggle in ministry, he says, is that their hearts might be encouraged, knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance and understanding of the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge are hidden. See, Christ, Christian wisdom and Christ's wisdom is manifest and grows, he says, among a people who are knit together in love, who are encouraging one another in the knowledge of Christ, as they put off all that is earthly in them, he says. What James would call the earthly wisdom that is from below, which destroys relationships with God and with each other. And put on, instead, the wisdom that comes from above, which breeds peace in relationships, not strife which binds everyone together in harmony. So to be a, a mature, a fruitful fellowship like that, Paul says, let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in all wisdom. How we need wisdom for salvation in Christ and for our service to Christ. But as Job says, well, where is wisdom to be found? Well, if it is God's wisdom from above, then it must come from above. And it does, as Paul says, in all the scriptures, the sacred writings, he says, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus, for salvation and for service, that you may be equipped for every good work. Now, we've just spent a long time, haven't we, studying together the law of Moses, and all of its valuable teaching and correction and instruction for righteousness. And there's a great deal there to make us and help us be wise for salvation and for service in Christ. But there is also, of course, in the Bible, a large corpus of what we call the wisdom literature. These are the scriptural books that are very especially focused on the time of the kingship in Israel. When... Uh, the nation of Israel reached its zenith of maturity as a glorious kingdom of peace. The land was conquered, enemies are subdued, an anointed son of God, a true king is reigning on the throne. And so God's land, God's kingdom can become a place of flourishing wisdom. And God's law, as we've already seen in our studies in Deuteronomy, it was far from exhaustive. It sets boundaries for thoughts, for actions. It sets trajectories for your thinking to follow it, to, to go on obeying God gladly and comprehensively in life. So that indeed, if you live like that, as, as Moses said, you remember, that will be your wisdom in the sight of all the peoples. God's people will be a kingdom of wise and glorious people, liberated to become more and more truly human. To be more and more imaging God here on earth. Showing forth the wisdom of the only wise God. And under Solomon, you see, we get a glimpse of what that looks like. When wisdom is so great that it draws the eyes of all the world around. And all come to see that great light, the Queen of Sheba and all the rest. And Solomon's great wisdom in all things included wisdom of the natural world, the animal world, and so on. It, it takes us back, doesn't it, to the very first chapter of the Bible, where Adam, God's first son before the fall, knows all these things, names all the animals, rules the world in great wisdom under God. But of course, like Adam, who fell, Solomon too was just a man who fell. He was a great king. 
And the first 10 chapters of First Kings describe the glory of his great kingdom. But then comes an enormous but. And we begin to see Solomon's downfall. And yet the glory and the, the wisdom of his reign does foreshadow one who would be far greater than Solomon. As the Lord Jesus Christ quite self-consciously was happy to describe himself. One greater than Solomon is here. The king that Isaiah later on promised to chasten Israel in their exile. The one who would arise at last from the stump of Jesse. On whom would rest the spirit of the Lord, the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and fear of the Lord. Notice wisdom and the fear of the Lord together. And so in Solomon's kingdom, wisdom did flourish. And the people of God exhibited a maturity, an understanding that had been hitherto unknown. And it was admired by all the world around. One writer points out something very significant. He says that it was with that coming of age, the freedom and the wisdom of the mature kingdom of Israel, that the kind of direct guidance from God that you saw from angels and dreams and so on that used to mark the earlier periods of Israel's history, that that seems to die away. And the chief counselors become the wise men who surround that supremely wise king. And they flourish with, with minds that are informed and renewed by God's great wisdom. And it's a picture. It's a foreshadowing of God's ultimate purpose. A world of rightness where right relationships reign. Because people see all reality through the riches of the life of God made known in the treasures of the wisdom and the knowledge of God revealed ultimately and fully in Christ. And so the more maturity and knowledge of God, the more wisdom. And the less need from, uh, for all that kind of guidance from outside. Because the more God's people are teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom. And that's how it should be, isn't it? In a mature church, according to Paul. Not a place where people are always rushing around seeking God's special guidance for this decision or that or this thing or that. Looking for signs or, or words or, or even putting out fleeces. You sometimes hear Christians using that sort of silly language. As though what Gideon did putting his fleece out was even a sensible thing in Gideon's time. God rebukes him for his lack of trust. No, no, no. When the word is dwelling richly among God's people, their wisdom is seen and known and understood among one another. So God's people are wise, wise about all of life, mature in their thinking, and then liberated to be fruitful, faithful, serving Christ in all sorts of different ways. That's why God's prayer for the, the Colossian church was that they would get wisdom. He's echoing, really, the words of Proverbs 4, verse 5. Get wisdom. Get insight. Do not forsake her, and she will keep you. Love her, and she will guard you. The beginning of wisdom is this. Get wisdom. And whatever you get, get insight. And the very first few verses of Proverbs that we read in chapter 1, they're written, aren't they, to impart wisdom and instruction. About 15 different words for wisdom there. And verse 5, to obtain guidance. Now many Christians, many young Christians in particular, are often desperate, aren't they, for guidance in all sorts of specific things. But God's answer is to say, get wisdom about all of life. And then you'll find that that need for, for special crisis guidance, in fact, just ebbs away as you're being transformed by the renewing of your mind for a life lived in all things in the wisdom that comes from above. One of the reasons I think that, that many Christians are uh, finding it very difficult to be guided in life, have such problems in guidance, is that they've neglected not only the Old Testament in general, but the wisdom books in particular. And so this little series over the next few weeks, what we're aiming to do is to stimulate our minds to delve into these rich books, which are written in a very particular way to make us wise, wise for salvation and wise for fruitful service in Christ. But here's a question. If, if Paul says all treasures of wisdom and knowledge 
are found in Christ, then why should we as Christians need to go back to find wisdom in the Old Testament? That's a fair question, I think, isn't it? Well, Jesus himself actually gives us the answer because he says, it is because these are the scriptures that bear witness about me. That is, these are the scriptures that expound Christ. And in particular, the wisdom books expound the unsearchable riches of the wisdom of God, which was fully manifest in man only in the person of Jesus Christ. So if we want to know all about Christ's wisdom for all of life, then this is where we need to look, in these scriptures. Because everything that they teach us of God's wisdom is what comes to its fulfillment in Christ. That's why these books are still in our Bibles, haven't been cut out. That's why the, the apostles quote them so much in their New Testament teaching. There's more than 60 uh, direct quotes from Proverbs in the epistles. Think of Peter and James. They both quote Proverbs 3.34, don't they? God gives grace to the humble but opposes the proud or the scoffer. Well, think of Hebrews 12 as it quotes uh, Proverbs 3 about God's discipline in life, being hard but useful. Or Romans 12 and 20, where Paul, Paul quotes Proverbs 25, verse 21, about heaping burning coals on an enemy's head by showing him kindness. Dozens and dozens of others, when you think about it, quoted in the New Testament. This is God's wisdom, which is Christ's wisdom. Just think of all Jesus' parables. The Greek word for parable is the translation of the Hebrew word proverb. Jesus taught in so many proverbs. So if we want great wisdom if we want to get the wisdom God wants us to have we need the wisdom of our great king the Lord Jesus Christ the wise king because it was his spirit who gave wisdom to Solomon to teach and to write so much here for us to make us wise for salvation in Jesus Christ and indeed for all our service of Christ so I want to give a taster just to whet your appetite to, to study these books of wisdom uh, for yourself. They're not so much how-to books, but as one writer puts it, how to be books, how to be wise. Proverbs is all about fruitful wisdom in the perception of life. And Job's all about fruitful wrestling in all the puzzles of life. Lamentations teaches us fruitful weeping in the pain of life. Song of Songs teaches about faithful wooing in the partnership in life, in marriage. And of course, Ecclesiastes, as we studied some years ago, shows us how to fruitfully work despite all the perplexities of life that are all around us. How to live, how to lose, how to lament, how to love, and how to live with our limitations in this mortal world. Vital things for us to know. So we're just going to spend one week having a bird's eye view of each of these books and to give some, some keys to help you read them. So it's a different kind of study from normal. We're not going to be expanding these books in detail. But I hope it'll help us get our Bibles open and get our minds uh, thinking so that we can learn ourselves. And in the time that we've got left this morning, then I want to focus on uh, a few things here that help us to approach the book of Proverbs. On page one of uh, your sheet there, you've got an outline for what we're going to look at now. The back page gives you a little outline of the whole book of Proverbs, perhaps to help you as you read through it yourself later. But here is a real treasure trove for fruitful wisdom in our perception, our thinking and looking at the whole of life. So a few words of general introduction to Proverbs and then some specific keys that I think we need to understand Proverbs properly. First of all then, Proverbs is clearly written mainly as words from a father to a son. A young man who's approaching adulthood and beginning to take his place in life as a leader, in marriage, in family life, perhaps in community life, and indeed if he is the king's son, then in national life and leadership. But don't worry, ladies, that does not mean that there's nothing here for women or for girls. Don't panic. Chapter 1, verse 8 is very clear, isn't it? It's a father and a mother who are teaching the uh, young person here. So clearly, women are not excluded. If they're going to be teachers, then first of all, obviously, they've got to be learners. We read in chapter 10, verse 1, again, a father and a mother. The very last chapter of the book, it ends, doesn't it? In almost the very last verse. The book concluding with talking about 
the, uh, the wisdom of the wife. We have the, uh, the vehement teaching of the queen mother. And then we have this virtuous example of the excellent wife. So don't worry, ladies. And even the feisty Meghan Markle can be reassured that the woman's voice is being heard in the book of Proverbs. Second thing. It's very important that this parental wisdom can be trusted. That's the point, isn't it? It's not just what is spoken, but it is who is speaking that really matters. That's why so many times in the first few chapters, the voice that you listen to is so important. Chapter 5, verse 1 to 3. My son, be attentive to my wisdom and not the lips of the forbidden woman. Her lips may drip with honey, they're smoother than oil, but in the end, those words will lead to death. Five times not to heed the voice of the adulteress. And chapter 9 concludes that introduction to the book with a stark choice between two women who personify either wisdom or folly. Lady Wisdom, whose teaching will lead to life, and Madam Folly, although her words are loud and seductive, They are ultimately lethal. So whose voice is heard and is heeded is a vital thing for God's people. That's something that's important all the way through the Bible. That's why the New Testament has such an emphasis, doesn't it, on identifying who are true teachers who must be heeded, who must be obeyed, and false teachers who must be resisted. If you don't know the difference between those two voices, you and the church will be destroyed. And so just like in Proverbs, all through the Bible, we will find it's the character of their lives that will give us a great clue about the corruption that comes from their lips. So the voice is important. Third thing, of course, the nature of Proverbs is also important. And Proverbs are quite different from what we've been studying in the Law of Moses. Once you get into the Proverbs proper from chapter 12 uh, onward, chapter 10 onwards, uh, you'll see that they're not didactic commands to believe and obey, but they're rather uh, shrewd observations about life, about creation, about human culture, about character. And they're phrased so as to make you think. They talk about life's delights as well as life's dangers, the ordinary things and the odd things. And they're laid side by side, aren't they, in pithy sayings, in in practical sayings, often provocative things, so that they'll teach us by provoking us to be thoughtful about life, but always in the light of the wisdom that comes from our wise faith in God. That's crucial. We'll come to that. So we mustn't take a proverb as if it was a command of Moses. It is just as authoritative, but in a very different kind of a way. For one thing, Proverbs tend to talk in generalities. That's the nature of them. So they tell us that sluggards don't prosper, nor do drunkards, nor do the hot-tempered, normally speaking. We can always think of exceptions, can't we? Just like the person who lives to 110 having smoked 60 cigarettes a day. It doesn't mean, does it, it's wise to go and smoke 60 cigarettes a day. We all know that. And that doesn't invalidate the wisdom So the maxims of Proverbs are not absolutes. And of course, the book itself recognizes that very clearly. Chapter 26, verses 4 and 5 are a very good example where it puts two absolute opposites right together, and both can be true. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest you be like him. Next verse, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own eyes. In other words, with a fool, it's sometimes very hard to win. So we mustn't be wooden. Proverbs are not laws, but they are instruction. They are Torah in that sense. They teach by making us think, as well as laugh, and often gasp or or even recoil in embarrassment as the message hits home. 25.14, like clouds and wind without rain is a man who boasts of a gift he does not give. All talk, but just wind. Or 11.22, like a gold ring in a pig's snout is a beautiful woman without discretion. Don't go chasing a sizzler and find yourself stuck with a sow. That's what it's saying. 
because better to live on the corner of a roof than share a house with a quarrelsome wife. That one comes twice, by the way. 21 verse 9 and 25 verse 24. So gents and ladies, take note twice. We've no time today to go into the, into the details of the Proverbs. That's for you to read. But I want to, to give a few key things to help us uh, keep in mind a right approach here. Four key things which I think we need to unlock the teaching of this book as Christians today. We need to understand wisdom in relation to righteousness and revelation and relationships and finally resurrection. So first, real wisdom is about righteousness. Turn to chapter 10 that we read uh, sections of earlier. We can see here something that uh, is true all the way through the book and that is that the wise person is the righteous one. The person who relates rightly to God. And the fool is someone who is wicked because they relate wrongly and refuse God's truth. So verses 1 and 2. A wise son makes a glad father, but a foolish son is a sorrow to his mother. Note father and mother. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit, but righteousness delivers from death. You see, that's true all through Proverbs, repeatedly. The wise and the fool are the righteous and the wicked. And they're used interchangeably. So verse 21 here. The lips of the righteous feed many, but fools die for lack of sense. The opposite of righteous is the fool. And verse 27. The fear of the Lord prolongs life, but the years of the wicked will be cut short. The opposite of wickedness is fear of the Lord. Note that to be righteous is to know the fear of the Lord. And notice verse 30, the very different final end of the righteous and the wicked. Either dwelling always with God or being removed from God's presence. That's very important. We'll come back to that. You see, when we read of wisdom and folly, we're not talking about an intellectual thing. It's not a matter of IQ. It's a spiritual thing. It's a right relationship with the Lord. That's real wisdom. That's righteousness. Or it's a wrong one. That's wickedness. That's folly. That's so, so important because the nature of wisdom teaching is often indirectly moral and spiritual, not direct as it is in the law of Moses. It doesn't often command us not to sin, not to do this. What it does do, it shows us the consequences of sin. And of folly. Because Proverbs, you see, focuses on the order in God's creation. And it shows us that sin is rebellion against God, and therefore that is folly. It's something that's destructive, it destroys uh, humanity. It's really showing us what Paul speaks about in Romans chapter 1 that sin turns the truth of God into a lie, and therefore it makes your hearts foolish and darkened. And when you do that, you will pay the penalty in a disrupted life, in a, in a disfigured life, ultimately in a destroyed life. But to restore and to sustain right relationships requires wisdom. Whereas the fool, look here, brings about verse 6, violence. And verse 12, strife. Verse 14, ruin. Verse 16, sin. And ultimately, verse 21, death. In the greatest folly the book is teaching us is to be in the wrong with God. That is unrighteousness. That is wickedness. And in that way is disaster. Verse 28, the expectation of the wicked will perish. Wisdom, you see, understands that there's a created order and there's a moral order to life and to the world. But the fool doesn't. So only the wise, only the one rightly related to God the creator can possibly understand the world and its order properly by observing it. Because he knows that literally it speaks with one voice. It's a universe that we're observing. It's intelligible because it displays the wisdom of the creator. That's why our universities are called that, by the way. They're set up to, dis to discover the universe, the one voice of the creator's intelligence in the world. It's ironic, isn't it, that so many academics today have no idea about that, deny that. 
So for all their wisdom, the Bible calls them fools. But the creator God of all things is the covenant God of Scripture. And so true knowledge of his creation, of all culture, of everything, it comes from a knowledge of him, a knowledge of the covenant God, the Lord. And he can only be truly known through his self-revelation to us, in his self-giving grace, and through a response to that grace in wholehearted trust, coming into a relationship of knowing him, rightness with him, righteousness, wisdom. Being rightly related to God is to be able to rightly read the world. Because that's where real wisdom begins. And that's the third thing you see. You can't possibly begin to understand the wisdom that we can see in the world without God's revelation. Knowledge of the true God, knowledge of the covenant God, unlock, unlocks all the knowledge in the created order. And so we're told no less than 18 times all through this book that the fear of the Lord is the very beginning of wisdom. So at the very beginning of the introduction, we read it in chapter 1, verse 7. It's there at the end of the introduction, chapter 9, verse 10. It's the motto of my old university, Initium Sapienti Timor Domini. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. So at the very end of the book, the second last verse, a woman who fears the Lord is to be praised. The very first step to being wise is fearing the Lord. No, it is not just fear of God, not just a sort of general respect of some, some creator out there. No, no, no. There are many God-fearing people in the world, aren't there, following some kind of vague folk religion. That's not what this is saying. It's fear of the Lord. It's the God of the Scriptures, the God with a name, the God who has drawn near to reveal himself in his gracious words and works. And calling forth from man a, a response of faith and of trust. A response that believes his promises and trusts him. And a response that believes his warnings and so reverently fears him. Charles Bridges puts it this way. Real fear of the Lord is that affectionate reverence by which the child of God bends himself hum humbly and carefully to his father's law. In other words, it's humble, penitent faith, isn't it? And so another phrase that you find all through the Proverbs is steadfast love, covenant love and faithfulness. The obedience of faith that holds fast to the Lord, the covenant God, that's the key to wisdom in life. That's the key to all real life and to blessing in this world. Wisdom, says 3 verse 18, is a tree of life to those who lay hold of her. The fear of the Lord, 14 verse 27, is the fountain of life. You see, the fear of the Lord, a response of faith to the revelation of God, that is the very beginning, the first step to wisdom in human life. And in a very real sense also, it's the goal of wisdom too. Chapter 2 verses 1 to 6 speak about thirsting for wisdom and seeking after it and that that in itself will lead to more knowledge of God. Then you will understand the fear of the Lord and find true knowledge of God. So what does that mean for us? Is that just a, a, an Old Testament idea, this business of fearing the Lord? No, 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 no. Read Mary's song in Luke chapter 1, the Magnificat, where she proclaims about the coming Savior bringing God's mercy. She says, to all who fear him. And Peter's preaching the gospel to the Gentile Cornelius in Acts chapter 10. He says, fear God and do what is right. That's what it means to respond to the Lord Jesus Christ. In Revelation, the very last book of the New Testament, chapter 14, verse 7, the angel proclaims the eternal Gospel, the eternal gospel. What is it? Fear God and give him glory, which means bowing down to the risen Lord Jesus Christ. So God's word is very plain. If you want to be wise in life and wise for life, if you want to understand this whole world and everything the world can teach us, you won't be able to do that 
unless you begin by bowing humbly to the wisdom that is revealed in the Lord Jesus Christ, in the king who is far, far greater than Solomon. And unless you do that, you can know, you can know vast amounts about the science of this world and know precisely nothing about the significance of this world. Think of, think of the intelligence and the knowledge of men like David Attenborough, or Richard Dawkins, or Stephen Hawking, and so many others like that. In the world's eyes, very, very wise men. Certainly huge intellects, huge knowledge. But in God's eyes, ultimately, fools. Because they reject God's wisdom. Proverbs 8, verse 36. Whoever finds me wisdom finds life. But whoever fails to find me injures himself. And all who hate me love death. Hating God's wisdom is the kiss of death. Now, solemn words, aren't they? Because real wisdom is about righteousness. And righteousness is all about a right response to God's revelation. And so third, it shouldn't surprise us, should it, should it, that real wisdom is also all about relationships. The vast bulk of the Proverbs are, uh, are all about wisdom that nurtures and cherishes right relationships and about the folly that spoils and destroys relationships. Well, relationships are at the very heart of human life here on earth, aren't they? We know that. And relationships surely are among our greatest sources of joy in this life and our greatest source of sorrow in life when those relationships end, especially in death that so grieves us. Or when relationships are lost through our folly, our bad behavior, our foolishness. That's because, of course, relationships are what human beings are made for. Above all, to relate to God himself who made us to relate to him. He is the speaking God who spoke us into creation and wants us to speak back to him, to respond to the God who reveals himself. And the wise person is the person who, who creates and who, who sustains and who cherishes relationships in life and who finds joy in them. While the fool is the one who disdains and destroys them and in so doing damages and diminishes himself and his own life. And again, it's not, it's not principally an intellectual wisdom that, is it? Some of the most intellectually endowed people in the world are the most incapable of sustaining rich and real relationships. Think of the brilliant professor who plows his way through five marriages. Or the brilliant doctor who can run a whole hospital but has absolutely no relationship anymore with his children because he's wrecked his marriage and destroyed his relationships. Or the super brainy graduates who can do endless mass problems but have absolutely no idea how to manage a household and their children. Well, you see, the Proverbs are here to help us with relational wisdom. How to be wise and not foolish in relating to our friends and our neighbors and our spouses and our bosses and our rulers and to animals and nature and the whole world and to ourselves and our own temptations. It's a book full of relational realism. So, for example, two key themes that are there in the first nine chapters of the father's warnings to his sons are all about the things that will easily wreck the relationships in a young man's life. They deal with a young man's propensity to violence, the lure of the gang in chapter 1, and with a young man's virility, which is why there's five times a warning against forbidden and illicit sexual unions. If you're not wise in those areas when you're a young man, there will be instability and loss almost certainly all through your life. And again, so many proverbs focus on the tongue, don't they? And on speech, because it's words that either build or break and blight relationships. Proverbs full of things about words. 15 verse 1, a soft answer turns away wrath, but a harsh word stirs it up. Isn't that true? And verse 2, the tongues of the wise commend knowledge, but the mouth of fools pour out folly. Or 1821, death and life 
are in the power of the tongue, and those who love it will eat its fruits. Watch your tongue. And in our day, I suppose, watch your tweets too. Some people need to listen to that very carefully. But you see, we need to be careful, don't we? Reckless words. Pierce like a sword, says chapter 12, verse 18. But the tongue of the wise brings healing. It's all about relationships, isn't it? And there are many, many more like that. In fact, chapters 25 to 29, you'll see, have particular clusters all about relationships with neighbors, with fools, with spouses, with kings, full of wisdom to, to sustain and strengthen relationships and not harm them. I love 25 verse 17. Let your foot seldom be in your neighbor's house, lest he have his fill of you and hate you. Sometimes less is more in relationships. Isn't that right? But not everybody gets that. So much about relationships. Because that's what righteousness is all about. Right relationships. Right relationships here on earth that reflect the right relationships in God's heavenly kingdom. Not the wrong relationships of the devil's hellish dwelling place. Read chapter 3 of James's letter later on this afternoon. Earthly wisdom, he says. Relationships full of bitter jealousy, selfish ambition, and boasting. That's demonic. But the wisdom that is from above, he says, is first of all pure, and then peaceable and gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And a harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. That's right out of Proverbs. James loves Proverbs. He's always quoting Proverbs. But that's what life is all about, ultimately. Righteousness. Right relationships on earth and in heaven. And real wisdom consists in finding these and never losing them. Not ever. And that brings us to the final key here that we need to understand this book because you see real wisdom can't be understood without grasping the reality of resurrection this is perhaps the most important key of all because it can seem to us as though the book of Proverbs is promising something more than is real something that just doesn't equate to real life so 21 verse 21 whoever pursues righteousness and kindness will find life and righteousness and honor or 22 verse 4, the reward for humility and the fear of the Lord is riches and honor and life. Now that just seems over the top. And it seems hard to equate, doesn't it, with Jesus' teaching. That the way of faith is hard. That it involves self-denial. That it involves cross-bearing. Is, is, is the gospel of Proverbs different? Is it a prosperity gospel? No, that's to misunderstand Proverbs. If you read carefully, you'll see many Proverbs are well aware that the wicked seem to prosper. We read it in chapter 10, verse 2. Treasures gained by wickedness. And it's aware of the privations of the godly. It talks about God's discipline, for one thing, being unpleasant in the present time. So what does it mean in Proverbs, this repeated maxim that life, life is the reward of the righteous and death is the lot of the wicked? Well, we need to understand what that life really means. And in nearly all of its uses in Proverbs, it clearly means something more than just mere physical life, clinical earthly life. Wisdom is the tree of life. And that signifies the life of God himself. In chapter 8, verse 35, life and the favor of the Lord are one and the same thing. In chapter 12, verse 28, we're told the path of the righteous is life, and in that pathway is no death, no death. So as somebody's put it, life is abundant life in fellowship with God, a living relationship with God that is never envisaged as ending, as Eternal death is contrasted for the wicked. The righteous will inhabit the land, but the wicked will be cut off from it. Chapter 2, verse 21. So when you read about length of days and long life that wisdom promises as her reward, 
it doesn't mean necessarily a long earthly life. It means a never-ending life, never cut off from the presence of the Lord forever and ever. That's how it's used so many times in the Bible. In Isaiah chapter 53, one great example where Isaiah speaks of the servant of the Lord's life being cut off as a sin offering. And after that, he will endure length of days, long life after death. It's there in the very last verse of the famous Psalm 23. I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever, for length of days, for long life. Or in Psalm 21, verse 4, where David says, He asked life of you and you gave it to him, length of days, forever and ever. So you see, life and death, all through these wisdom books, means ultimate life and ultimate death. Life with God and life excluded from God. Life lived in God's presence now and always is what life is. But not so for the wicked. The wicked has a very different latter end or future. And again, that's a phrase all through Proverbs translated differently. But let's just look as we close at one place that makes that so clear. Chapter 24 and verse 14, page 546. Proverbs 24, 14, if you find wisdom, there will be a future and your hope will not be cut off. No end of life in God's presence for the wise. Contrast verse 20, for the evil man has no future. The lamp of the wicked will be put out. And so you see the previous verse, verse 19, fret not because of evildoers. Don't be envious of the wicked. For the evil man has no future. His lamp will be put out. See the end. See the future. Just like Psalm 73 where the psalmist is agonized because the wicked seem to be prospering and the godly are always perishing. Until he went into the sanctuary, the place of revelation, and I discerned their end, their future. And that's all the way through the book of Proverbs. Treasures gained by wickedness do not profit in the end, but righteousness delivers from death. The wicked is overthrown by his evil doing, but the righteous finds refuge in his death. 14 verse 32. Mortal life will end for both, for everybody. But for the wise... The Proverbs writer tells us death is not our ruin, but our refuge. Because it's the gateway to everlasting life in the presence of God. And so as chapter 3 verse 5 says, we can trust God with all our heart. We don't need to be perturbed when mere earthly insight would suggest a very different way. No, in all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your path straight because it is the path of unending life with him forever and ever. That's the promise of Proverbs. That's the promise of the wisdom of Solomon. How much more in our better and clearer and richer promises from the one greater than Solomon, the Lord Jesus Christ, who has already arisen never to die again. How much greater our assurance in Jesus, our Savior, in whom are hidden all treasures of wisdom and knowledge. But he's given us this book and these others to make us wise and fruitful in our perception of life if we will see it in the light of his revelation and of his ultimate glory and grace. So let's get wisdom and let's share wisdom Let's walk in a manner worthy of our great and wise King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. The wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. Lord, grant us, we pray, your wisdom. That as the Apostle Paul says, in malice 
We may be but infants, but in understanding, in wisdom, mature, true men and women of God in Christ, for his great glory's sake. Amen. Well, as we come to God's table then, we're going to sing together number 669. 669 in our blue books. Listen, wisdom cries aloud, making truth and justice heard, calling to a careless crowd with the strong insistent word, turn from foolishness and lies. Come, and I will make you wise. Number 669. Please be seated. Well, we come as guests invited to the table of our great and wise King, the only wise God, our Lord Jesus Christ. And so it's right that we should remember that this table and this sacrament is a memorial of the great sacrifice of Christ for the sins of his people. A memorial, as we often say in the Bible, is not so much about us remembering, although it does draw us to remember, but it is principally about God remembering. So we come to this table to say to God, the Father, remember your promises, remember your covenant, and have mercy upon us. As God said to Noah, I will put my bow, the rainbow, in the sky, and when I see it, I will remember my promise never to destroy again the earth. But when the destroying angel came through the camp, the people of Israel in Egypt, and saw the blood on the doorposts and upon the lintels, God remembered his promise to show mercy 
and to spare those who sheltered under his blood. God loves to be called to remembrance of his promises. That's what faith is. It's saying to God, thus you have promised, thus you must do. Not only to be faithful, but to be just. And so this table is a memorial, a calling of God to remember what he has promised to us. To everyone who has faith in the sacrifice of his son, he will be faithful and just to forgive us our sins. And that's why this table is a true means of grace to all who believe in him. Because we are coming truly to interact with God our Father, calling out to him to remember and rejoicing in the assurance he gives us that his promises are true and his forgiveness is real. And also this table is a bond and a pledge of our union with Christ and therefore our union with one another as his people, all one in Christ Jesus. And so it's far from being an empty thing. It is replete with the grace and the goodness of God, with the glory of Christ, and with the joy of the fellowship of being his people. So it's necessary that we come with knowledge, with faith, and with real repentance, and with love. We can't come to this table while we hold fellowship with evil. We can't come to this table while we cherish pride or, or self-righteousness in our hearts. Because it speaks to us of the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ. And of his great humbling and his great sacrifice for our sins. And so we come conscious of our weakness, full of sorrow for our sins, and humbly putting our trust in Christ and hungering and thirsting after him and seeking his grace. But the Lord Jesus tells us that all who come in that humble trust, in true love for the Savior, for the Lord Jesus, all who come thus are welcome at his table. It's not our table. It's not this congregation's table. It is the table of our Lord Jesus Christ. And it is he who invites to it. So if you come in humble consciousness of your sins, in humble trust in the Lord Jesus, don't let anyone hinder you. And don't let your own heart hinder you. Often our hearts hinder us, don't they? Because of that consciousness of sin. Listen to what people said once of the Lord Jesus. This man receives sinners and even eats with them. Yes, he does. And he's doing so again today, this morning, right here with us. Because he says, I've come not to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. So come and feast with him. It is a table for sinners not for proud sinners, but yes, for every penitent sinner who heeds his voice. So let's hear the gracious words of our Lord Jesus himself. Come to me, he says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy. And my burden is light. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never hunger. Whoever believes in me shall never thirst. The one who comes to me, I will by no means ever cast out. Rather blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness. For, says the Lord Jesus, they will be filled. They will be filled. So hear the words of the institution of this supper as they're delivered to us by the Apostle Paul. He says, I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. Do this as a remembrance for me. 
In the same manner, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you, as you, as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Proclaim it to ourselves. Yes, proclaim it to one another. But above all, as I've said, we proclaim it to God. And we say to him, remember. Remember your promise sealed in the blood of your son. And so as the Lord took bread and wine, we similarly take these ordinary elements. But we take them and use them for this great purpose, to proclaim the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ until he comes. And so as the Lord prayed and gave thanks, as they came to the table, let us also join our hearts together in prayer. Lord, we thank you for the wonderful proclamation of this table before us, to our ears, to our eyes, and even right into our own bodies as we take this bread and wine that preaches to us the wonder of your gospel, that turns our minds back to that great day in history when once and for all our sins and our transgressions were washed away forever in the death of our great Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And they turn our eyes also, Lord, to the future, to that which is still to come, for the great consummation, the wedding feast of the Lamb, and the joy unspeakable in your presence when those of every tribe and language and people and nation join together in singing praise to the Lion of Judah, the Lamb who was slain. And even now, Lord, the joy of its message to our hearts that reminds us you are the one who has said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. And behold, I am with you even unto the end of the age. And so until that great day when we see you as you truly are and when we shall be like you, we rejoice that even now we can know you and be near you. And as we come to this table, we can know the joyful assurance in our hearts of sins forgiven, of peace with heaven, of fellowship with the Father and the Son, and of the joy of belonging to your great family of grace. So help us, Lord. May we eat and drink in faith and so proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. And so the Lord Jesus, on the night in which he was betrayed, he took bread and said, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this, all of you, as often as you eat it. And he took the cup and said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. So now as the service come, if you would take the bread and eat as it's given to you, Take the cups of wine and hold them until we're all served together here upstairs and downstairs, and then we'll eat and uh, we'll drink together as one in communion. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he come. Let's drink together.
peace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. We're going to sing as we uh, close together this morning. Number 761. Number 761. Who trusts in God's unchanging love builds on the rock, the rock of wisdom that none can move. Number 761. Well, it's been rather lovely that we have been all together this morning for communion, and uh, perhaps you'll have an uh, opportunity after the service to greet those that you don't normally see uh, on a Sunday morning. But as we close now, the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of his Holy Spirit be with you all now and always. Amen.